If you would, uh, stand with me for the reading of the Word of God today. I know we just sat down. When I uh, started in ministry right after Bible college, my first position was principal in a Christian school and youth pastor in Connecticut. And every morning in the Christian school, we would pledge allegiance to the American flag and to the Christian flag. And uh, we would always stand for the reading of the scriptures. And I always thought it was an encouraging thing to do, to stand, the respect and the reverence that it shows for the word of God. I mean, we stand when a judge enters a courtroom, they'll have everybody stand. And how many of you know it's the word of God? And so thank you for standing with me today. Colossians chapter 2, going to read verses 13 through 15. Colossians 2, 13 through 15. Simple thought, I'm calling it canceled. <laughs> Praise God. <clears throat> when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. And he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for your word. Bless it today. Let it speak to hearts and lives. Bring us real change. Draw us closer, Lord Jesus. And in this Thanksgiving season, as we approach that celebration, I pray, God, that you will cause us to be thankful for what you've done in our own lives. So thankful, Lord Jesus, that we will demonstrate that same love toward those who are in need and even toward those who have offended us. And we give you glory and honor for this in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. 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 <laughs> you may be seated. Thank you for standing. I want you to notice the portion of these verses that we just read, this portion in particular that says, He forgave us all our sins and canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us and has taken it away. Wow. Wow nailing it to the cross. God didn't just forgive us and take away our sin. <laughs> he made sure it was dead and gone. He nailed it to the cross in his own body. What a beautiful testimony that is. You know, we live in a world that cancels anything and everything that disagrees with it. As a matter of fact, it seems like our culture has lost the ability to agreeably disagree. How many of you would say amen to that? As a matter of fact, the modern form uh, or term for this is cancel culture. A lot of people talk about that, that we live in some sort of cancel culture where if you just don't agree with me, then uh, I'm canceling you out. When I think about that, I not only think of the foolishness of it, because I've witnessed that in my own life. I've witnessed the truth that you never really cancel anybody out. There's, you'll always have that ought or offense against them. It just doesn't go away because you, you, know, you deleted them from your Facebook page or Instagram or something. The truth is they're still there and their comment is still there. And the next thing you know, someone else feels the same way they did. And now you're canceling them. After a while, you've just canceled so many people. You're down to just the folks that mostly agree with you. And you're thinking about canceling some of them. <laughs> Isn't that an amazing thing? And in recent years, I've noticed something that I didn't grow up with. And that is that the election cycles, how that people actually have no room for anyone unless they're in full agreement with them on just about everything. I've witnessed something that I've just never seen before in all my life, and, and that is that people will leave their home church over an election. They'll give up friends during an election. Some will refuse to even celebrate the holidays with their own family members <laughs> over the elections. Well, praise God. <clears throat> Might have hit somebody just now, I feel like. 
But when the, when the gospel reaches the heart of a man or a woman, he removes out of us any reason for canceling people. And let me tell you why he does that, how he removes that from our heart. He, he does it because you make, when you get saved, you make the most startling discovery. You suddenly realize the purpose of the cross. Your eyes are open to the truth of, of sin. And once you, you are overwhelmed with the truth about sin, you realize not only that sin is real, you realize that hell is a real place of separation from God. And then when you are truly saved, sin becomes repulsive to you. And you feel this tension in your life, this tension between the beauty of the holiness of God and the ugliness of sin and Satan. And then you have this, once saved, you have this incredible awareness. Not, not only is sin terrible, is sin ugly, but you have an awareness of your sin. You, you suddenly realize, oh my goodness, I... I've been separated from God. Now, the remarkable thing about this discovery of, of sin is that once you give your heart and life to God, you, you, didn't, you didn't know really what sin was. You, you grow in the knowledge of sin. You, you learn that through the scriptures, as you start being discipled and you understand the word of God, you, you start recognizing, oh, that, that, that's a sin. That was, that was wrong. You start feeling conviction about things uh, that you didn't know were sin. And in other words, when you first gave your heart to Christ, you were instantly forgiven. You were cleansed of your sin. You, how many of you are grateful for that? You were forgiven, but it wasn't, God wasn't through with you. You begin to discover, oh, I need to change that in my life. Or, Man, that's not an attitude that pleases God. And so this discovery through the word of God of what sin is, continues in your life. You begin to realize, oh man, that, that's, that's, a, that's sin, that's ugly to me. You, you start feeling a repulsion, a rejection of the sin in your own life. And after a while, it just becomes difficult to judge anybody around you. <laughs> you, you, you can't quite cancel anybody out because God didn't cancel you. Can somebody shout hallelujah? And so out of the gratitude for God's grace and love towards you, there becomes this understanding of other people, this great grace toward people around you. Suddenly you find yourself loving people that were unlovable because you at one time were unlovable. I know that's hard to believe. <laughs> You're just so lovable. Now I'm so grateful for you. It's awesome. I'm just privileged to know you. But, it's, but for God to receive us and forgive us and cleanse us, wow. And so the almighty God the, presents the only remedy for sin. He's holy through and through. He's the judge of all the earth. You come to understand that sin has to be condemned and punished, and you realize that's why Jesus died on the cross. He had to die. There was no other alternative. He had to come because all sin needed to be condemned. All sin needed to be punished. And so the Holy Spirit himself, that's his job. His job is to convict the world of sin, to convict the world of unrighteousness. And so he brings conviction into our life. And daily we discover this as we're being uh, uh, crucifying our flesh that we're putting away more and more of the things that are unlike God and we're drawing closer to God. And so when that's your focus, you have a hard time judging other people. We find ourselves kind of like the two men that Jesus spoke of. You remember? They came into the temple, and one of them uh, was a publican and uh, the, or a tax collector in our modern terminology, and the other one was a Pharisee. And the Pharisee looked over at this tax collector, and he said to him, of him to the Lord, he said, Thank you, Lord, I'm not like this man. Thank you, Lord, that I am, I've never done any of the things that you've done, never committed 
committed adultery, never done all of those things. Look at this guy. I'm not like this tax collector. I'm so glad I'm, I'm awesome and, and uh, just wanted to make sure you knew that, Lord. And so on the way out, uh, he, as he's leaving, the, the tax collector begins to beat his chest and say, God, forgive me. I am a sinner. God, forgive me. I am a sinner. And so as he smote his chest, Jesus then turns and asks the crowd, he said, which one of these do you think went home righteous that day? Do you think it was the one who didn't realize, who thought he was better than somebody else, or the one who could freely admit, hallelujah, that he needed a Savior? I'm just here to tell you that if you know who you are, then you're not judging yourself by other people. You're only measuring yourself by the Word of God. Can somebody shout hallelujah? Because you know what God's done in your life. And today, our, our choices really are, do I go home righteous by getting the judgment out of my heart, by recognizing who I am and not judging anyone else around me? Or do I go home unrighteous? Do I go home thinking I'm all that? Wow. So this awareness of God brings me to this place that I realize I am guilty. I need a Savior. When I was 17, I gave my heart to Christ and Man, what a beautiful journey it's been. I'm so grateful for salvation. 17 years old. It was 52 years ago and that I made that commitment to the Lord. And having given my heart to Christ at 17, I, my father, my dad, he used to hold Bible studies. And he had this incredible ability to draw young people. And so our, our uh, home was filled with young people. Once or twice a week, Dad would have a Bible study, and it would just pack out with teenagers and college-age kids. We lived up in Newland, North Carolina. And so at 17, I gave my heart to Christ. And so I'm in one of those prayer meetings at my house, and everybody gathered together, and we're all praying, and we got in a circle. And it was right in the height of the Jesus Revolution, the Jesus Movement, 1973, and and so God has gotten a hold of my heart, and I'm so excited about Jesus, and I'm so thrilled with what God's doing in my own life, and I'm just feeling really good. And so right there in the middle of that prayer meeting, I mean, we would pray and pray. We were all praying out loud. We were praying to the top of our voice, this room packed with teenagers and college-age kids, and Dad standing there trying to mediate it all right at the end of the Bible study. And as we were praying, I had... A vision. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in visions or not. It's come too late to tell me. I already had one. So I had this, <clears throat> I had a vision. I, I, I saw the, it was like clouds that went back and I saw the cross and I couldn't see the face of the man in the clouds. I, I could just see that he was nailed to the cross and I knew in my heart it was Jesus. And as I'm seeing just the torso I saw coming out of those clouds, I saw this spear coming and I saw these hands and the spear went into the side of Jesus and I saw the blood and the water come out and then, then it turned and the hands were on it and it turned and it was me, I was, it was me, it was, it was me holding that spear. Why? Well, I fell to my knees there in the middle of all those teenagers and I began to cry out to God. And I'd already given my heart to God, but I came to a realization that it was for me he died. It was for my sin. And when you recognize that, you truly realize that if you had been the only one, if you had actually been the one who crucified him, he would have forgiven you and cleansed you and died on the cross anyway. Oh, hallelujah. Can you give God a thank offering for that? And it changes everything about your life. It changes your future. It changes your, your purpose. It, it changes your attitudes. So it did a deep work in me that night. I was, I'd already given my heart to Christ, but it was, it was like a, a new experience with God that had brought me into this deeper relationship with the Lord. It took judgmentalism out of my heart and life. And from that day to this, I've never understood how one forgiven human being can look at another human being who needs salvation also and pass judgment upon them without praying and interceding for them. Can somebody shout hallelujah? 
We had a song that we sang when I was a young man coming up. It was called, I Should Have Been Crucified. And the words, when I should have been crucified, I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace. But Jesus, God's son, took my place. <laughs> man, what a wonderful truth. But it gets better than that. He did more than forgive my sin. The scripture said he canceled my legal indebtedness. I was legal, legally obligated to be punished for my sins. I was guilty. It wasn't, it wasn't that he forgave me and, and in his forgiveness of me, then I went ahead and I'm forgiven, but I've still got to suffer for my crime like I'd gone before a human court. But instead, I went before heaven's court. And even though I was guilty, he made it just as if I had never sinned. He took away, here it says, canceled my legal indebtedness. I am no longer legally obligated to be punished. Can somebody shout hallelujah? God took that away from my life. So much so that I'm no longer in condemnation. I'm, it's not just that I'm not, I'm not only forgiven, I'm not condemned. Hallelujah. I will not be punished for my past. I will not be punished for the things he has forgiven me of. What a mighty Savior we serve. What a mighty Savior we serve. He canceled my legal indebtedness. Two truths I want to simply leave with you today. And the first is that Christ's love for you can never be canceled. I know it's a crazy world we live in, but Christ's love for you will never be canceled. It doesn't matter where you've been or what you've done or what's gone on in your past. His love for you will never be canceled. As a matter of fact, he loved you while you were still a sinner. Hallelujah. And he still loves you. One of my favorite portions of Scripture is Romans chapter 8, verses 37 through 39. And in it, verse 37 says, In all these things we are made more than conquerors through him who loved us. So it's his love for me that makes me more than a conqueror. Knowing that he loves me gives me victory, in other words. It makes me a conqueror. So I've got victory in life just because he loves me. His love for me, I keep that victory because I know his love for me will never be canceled. Even when I'm wrong, even when I've made mistakes, as when I come to him and say, God, I, I did it again, and he receives me right away. He's canceled my legal indebtedness, and he, his love will never end for me. I have victory because I know he loves me. Hallelujah. And his love for me can never be, never be canceled. And that's why... Because of his love for you, you're more than a conqueror. What does that mean? I I'm, I'm not only have victory over the fear of, of judgment, but I have victory over my flesh. I have victory because he loves me over the things that tempt me and lead me to failure. I have victory over sin in my life. I was given that when he, he canceled my sin. He not only did that, but he gave me victory. He loved me so deeply that that love gives me an assurance that I'm more than a conqueror, even over me, over my flesh, over sin, over temptation, over wickedness. That's a beautiful thing about it is that I can, I can live in this present world in a culture that is increasingly wicked and contrary to my biblical values, I can still live righteous and still live godly and still walk faithful to God because of his great love for me. I have been made more than a conqueror. No matter where I live, what culture I live in, what country I live in, I am more than a conqueror through him who loved me. And it's his love for me that gives me that kind of victory. And his love also gives me voice. And, and by that I mean it, it, because of his love, I can speak with faith. Whatever I'm facing in my life, I can look at it and say, I'm more than a conqueror because Jesus loves me. Whatever mountain I need removed, I can speak with faith at that mountain and say, be removed and cast into the sea because I know Jesus loves me. Verse 38 and 39 there of Romans chapter 8 put it this way. I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Hallelujah. So, in other words, because Jesus loves me, I can speak life. 
I can speak life no matter what comes my way. Death can come my way, I speak life. Uh, and, and the angels can come my way, I speak life. Life itself with all its hardships comes at me, I speak life, I speak faith because uh, God's love gave me that voice. Hallelujah. Because I know he loves me, neither height nor depth nor principalities or angels or demons or anything else can separate me from the love of God. Men, it's something, the power and the authority that you have when you know that he loves you. Isn't that an awesome thing? Oh, thank you for that, Jesus. So what that means is that instead of talking about my problems, I can talk about the problem solver. If you're going to talk about the mountain, talk about it from a divine perspective. Change your focus. Our problem is we look up at mountains from our focus. But when you see it from God's focus, you're looking down on the mountain. And so you realize that no matter how large the problem seems, no matter how difficult it seems, because he loves me, I can speak to that mountain and that mountain will be removed. And so instead of canceling my faith, I cancel my fear. I remember that perfect love cast out all fear. And then I want to shift from what he's done for me and what that love has given my, me, the voice of faith. It's given me victory in my life, knowing he loves me, knowing that he has canceled the legal indebtedness in my life. That's what it does for me. But then it, he doesn't just leave it there. He goes on and expects me to do the same thing, to walk in that same grace and forgiveness toward everybody around me. I am to forgive as I have been forgiven by Christ. I am to love others the way he loved me. Now see, that's where the rubber meets the road. <laughs> it's so easy, isn't it, for us to talk about how good God's been to us and how much he's forgiven us and hallelujah. And it makes us want to throw our hat over the windmill and just do a big dance and jig give him all the glory and praise for what he's done for us but then he comes to us and says i want you to forgive others the same way i've forgiven you and you're like well let's talk about that <laughs> and so lord you you canceled out my sin and transgression how in the world can i do that toward other people so the second thought is just this don't cancel Christ's love through you. Since he canceled your legal indebtedness, moved all that from you, don't cancel his love through you. 1 Peter 3 verse 10 says, for the scriptures say, if you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, turn to someone beside you and say, happy days are here again. <laughs> happy days. Be a good name for a TV show, wouldn't it? If you want to enjoy life and see many happy days, keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Well, we could have gone all day, Pastor Richard, and not even brought that scripture up, but there it is. And so what it means simply is do not cancel the love of God from flowing through you to others around you. Luke 14 verse 13 says, and I love this in the Thanksgiving season. We have, I noticed that someone shared this, this week about how we, there were 300 boxes packed for, to be given to people in need of food just here at the church just over the weekend. Isn't our God good? Aren't you glad to be a part of a church that's already reaching out like that? Hey Amen. Come on. Can we give God a praise offer? And we're not through. But don't cancel Christ's love through you to others. When you give a feast, invite the poor. The maimed, the lame, and the blind. Just make sure they're not of the other political party. Oh, wait, that's not in there, is it? I'm sorry. I, it is Thanksgiving. You all know that's coming right up, right? Jesus never revealed compassion for anyone because they deserved it. He did it because they were in need. 
And when you show kindness to someone who cannot repay you, God will take up their cause and repay their debt to you. That's God's promise. Don't cancel the love of God from flowing through you and flowing out of your lips. My goodness, we can say some of the harshest things. We can be so cruel to other people. I, I love Colossians 2, verse 13 and 14. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, remember this, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. So instead of canceling the person, two quick principles. Cancel the debt. Instead of canceling the person, cancel the debt. Instead of canceling you, God canceled your debt. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So how you do that is you give them life with your words. You give them life with your actions. You, you have pity on them, and you let them go. You cancel the debt. There's a beautiful story shared in Matthew 18, 27. Let me, let me just share it with you quickly before we close. I think it's one of the most powerful in all the Bible. Verse 27 says, The servant's master took pity on him and canceled the debt. Everybody say canceled. And let him go. So we have this authority to cancel the debt of those who owe us, who have offended us. We have the ability, the power, the authority to cancel the debt and let them go, the Bible said. In that story, you remember the king, the servant came to the king and he owed the king an incredible amount of money, 10,000 talents of silver. And he owed him this incredible debt. Would have been millions of dollars in our economy. And the king looked at him and forgave him. Rather than punishing him and judging him, he canceled his debt and released him. So instead of canceling the man, he canceled his debt. His legal indebtedness would have meant that he had to go to jail. He had to be bound in prison. He would go and spend his life in prison and his family in prison for the rest of his life. But instead of doing that, the king released him, forgave that million-dollar debt, and let him go. Well, wouldn't you know, Matthew 18 tells the story, that he goes out and finds a servant who owed him ten talents. <laughs> and he demanded he repay him. He shook him and shoved him around. Pay me back. And the man said to this forgiven servant, he said, well, I don't have it. And so he takes that servant. He takes that man. He throws him into jail with his wife and his children and casts them in jail. Well, when the king heard about it, the king was like, I forgave you this incredible debt, and here you are casting somebody in jail over a mu much less of a debt. So can I say to you, since God has forgiven you of a debt you could not pay, can somebody shout hallelujah? And it was growing every day. Since he forgave you, you should forgive others. He's freely forgiven you. And so the only way I know to do that is give them life with my words and my actions, give them grace with forgiveness. And then the second thing that Jesus did in our text is he didn't cancel the person, you. He canceled the debt, the offense. The second thing he did, the Bible said, is he nailed it to the cross. Well, that's the solution. Because to be honest with you, after all these years of serving God, I find it difficult sometimes to forgive folks of some of the stuff that they've said or done to me or my family through the years. It's been very difficult. And so the only way I knew how to do it, that I could, instead of canceling them, cancel the debt, is I would quickly nail that offense to the cross. Well, how do you nail that offense to the cross? Colossians 2 tells us that. We nail it by first, we give the offense to the king. Because, see, we can't do it. We don't have it in our nature to forgive people. We want to cancel them. But we want to cancel the person. But God challenges us, don't cancel the person, cancel the debt. How do I do that? Well, I go to the king because the king nailed it to the cross. He's the only one who can. And so I fall on my knees in prayer. That's what happened with you. Even when you can't forgive yourself, where do you go? You go to the king. 
You go to Jesus, and in prayer, you give it to him. And when you give it to him, how many of you are thankful that he forgives you and cleanses you and nails it to his cross? Well, that's what I do with the offense of others. I go to the king, and I give it to him. Lord, they've wounded me. Lord, they've hurt me. Lord, help me love them the way that you love them. I'm giving this offense to you, and I'm asking you to nail it to the cross. In the mighty name of Jesus. Can somebody shout hallelujah? So you get, he has the authority, he has the grace, he has the power to forgive us our debts. Watch this, Matthew 6 and 12, as we forgive the debt of others. So he forgives us our debtors. We forgive our debts and he forgives our debtors, the Bible says. So I go to him and he, the king, can forgive my debtor. Hallelujah. And then... The last thought is the lost and other believers begin to see the grace and love in our life. One of the strongest witnesses and testimonies you can give to another person or someone who doesn't even know the Lord is that you walk in the grace of Jesus toward others, that you're able to forgive, that you're able to move forward. Oh, I'm telling you, hear me in this word today. This word will save your, bring your children back to God. This word will reconcile families. This word will keep a marriage together. When you learn how to cancel the debt and not the person. When you learn to walk in the grace of God toward your spouse, toward your children, toward your friends, and even toward your enemies. <laughs> Suddenly, you'll find the grace of God flowing through you in such a way that people will look at you with absolute amazement. You cannot believe that you did that. 1 John 3 and verse 14, would you stand with me as we pray? 1 John chapter 3 verse 14 says, We know. You know, I, I think I'll just read this and leave it. <laughs> it's hard enough to read, much less walk out. But we know that we have passed from death to life. Because we love the brethren, he who does not love his brother abides in death. John thirteen thirty five. By this, all will know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. The only way for people to even know we're Christians is if we can walk in this kind of grace and love that's been given us. Don't walk away. We live in a walk away world. People walk away from everything and everybody. Don't be one of those. Be the kind of believer who stays, who stays connected, who keeps loving. It's when God tenderizes your heart and he, he melts your heart like that and puts in you that grace to walk in that kind of mercy. Man, everybody around you sees that. And they know it's not human. They know it's not normal. They know it's not natural. So they know it's supernatural, so they have to turn and say it must be this Jesus they're talking about that enables them to walk in that kind of grace and love. Well, let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we truly live in a wicked and an unforgiving world. There has never been in my lifetime, a greater day or opportunity to be countercultural. It's in this darkness that we can be light. It's in the midst of this wickedness that we have the opportunity to reveal godliness. It's in a cancel culture that we have the opportunity to accept and forgive one another with a love and a grace and a forgiveness that cannot be duplicated by this world. So God, Help us to realize we have what the world needs. We possess the love of God, and we are possessed by the love of God. Let us love and forgive as we have been loved and forgiven. While our heads are still bowed, I just can't help but believe that there's someone in this room that thought God can't forgive me I've gone too far I've done too much I've, 
the things I've done are unforgivable. I'm a disappointment to others. I'm a disappointment to myself. And you're thinking that he can't do it, but today you heard his word. And you've heard that no matter what you've done or where you've been, that he will cancel your debt, not you, your debt. He will cancel your sin. He will remove it from you as far as the east is from the west. And if you want that kind of love and forgiveness in your life, maybe right now, I'm going to count to three, and I'm going to ask if that's you and you want to give your life to Jesus, that you just throw your hand up in the air and, and say, that's me. One, two, three. People already throwing their hands up. God bless all those hands. Oh, my goodness. Wow. Already. Isn't that wonderful? Praise you, Jesus. Well, we're going to pray with each of you. Come on. We can, let's thank God for that. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. I wonder if we can pray with those who want to give their life to Jesus today that have been lifted their hands, and let's just pray together out loud. And In this way, we're assisting them in their return to the Father, to God. Let's pray this prayer out loud together, everyone with me. Mighty God, once more, mighty God, I know you love me. I love you. I accept your grace. I receive your forgiveness. Forgive me. Cleanse me. Would you take my life? Use me for your honor. Use me for your glory. Help me to love others and forgive them the way you've forgiven me. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, can we put our hands together and thank God? Wow. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. We're going to ask our altar team to come up here around the front. I would love to meet those that raise their hands and pray with you myself. I'll be up here. If you need prayer for anything, our altar team will be up here around the altar and willing to pray with you right up here around the front. Would you come this way? God bless you. Thank you for coming to Calvary. You are dismissed.